I'm live. Yay. How's it going, uh, person? There's a person there. Wow. Okay, so suddenly I can't see the chat, which I guess is good because I never look at the chat anyway during a show, except for the part where I like to see if people are chatting. I don't know if you can hear me, and I don't know if there's a way that you can tell me that you can. This is really just, um, yeah, this is going excellent so far. Where's the chat? Where's the chat? No, nope, that's been back. Hold on. I'm new at this. <sighs> that's kind of a bummer because I want to be able to see if or when. Ouch. Okay, somebody just sent me a message saying that they can hear me, which is good. Except I don't know if you can hear that. Don't tell me, though. You see, now there's nobody watching according to this. Ah, oh, geez. Whatever. How do I view? Well, you know what? I'll just see if I can figure it out later. In the meantime, we get a show to do. So stand by for that. Am I? Uh, you'd think I had never done this before. <laughs> I've actually done it four times before. I still want to figure out why I can't see what anybody is saying. Ah, if you will allow me one more moment, I'm going to see if I can do that. Because I like doing the thing where we talk afterwards. That won't do it. Okay. Uh, haha, that's an interesting idea, but I don't want to run two browsers. So... All right, we'll just go and see what happens. I could do that later. Hold on, I could do that. Wait a moment. I'm going to check one more thing. I'm sorry, we really are going to get going here in just a second. I can tell you what we're going to talk about, but then, of course, I'm going to tell you what we're going to talk about again in a moment, so that might not be the best idea. All right, there's me. Whoa, now I'm talking. Okay, hold on, sorry. Hey, cool. Nobody's saying anything in the chat anyway. So far out. I got it on my phone. Nobody's saying anything there. So rock on. I'm going to get started here in a second. In fact, we can get started here right now. Are you ready to uh, rock? Taking a look at Apple's App Store Offensive and TV is officially watching you. It is Friday, the 25th of September, 2020. Let's do a thing, shall we? Hi, I'm Ken Ray, welcoming in you to what I guess we're going to call Mac OS Ken Live. Put out the call uh, yesterday or the day before, I can't remember which, and said, hey, what should we call this? And nobody said anything. So you're going to end up with Mac OS Ken Wesley, just you watch. Probably not going to end up with that. Coming up in the second half of the show, I did a scary story to me, scary story uh, for the checklist this week. That's the show I produce for Secure Mac, who's been making uh, you know exceptional security software for over 20 years, according to the ad that I wrote for them. Great bunch of guys there. And I uh, came across a story, something that the Mozilla Foundation did studying advertising in over-the-top and streaming TV services. So we're going to talk about that a little bit, a little bit later. I'm not going to get too in-depth on it because i got a couple of other places I can send you for that. Before we do that, though, I want to talk about what's going on uh, with Apple and the App Store and the coalition for uh, people who hate Apple. I can't remember what that thing was called. Uh, the Coalition for App Fairness, I believe it was called. So basically yesterday, uh, we got a story from Mac Rumors that said that Apple had overhauled the About the App Store and the developing for the App Store uh, pages. Because, of course, Apple has been taking a lot of flack, getting a lot of uh, heat from, oh, Congress, Germany, the EU, Epic Games, Spotify. That's ongoing. Apple's been taking a lot of heat. What's interesting is you could say that Apple's been taking a lot of heat from a lot of developers, but I don't really think of Spotify as a developer. I think of Spotify as a company that's disrupting music. They're taking heat from Tile. I don't think of Tile as a developer. Yes, they developed hardware. Yes, they developed the system whereby you can keep track of stuff, but they're not a developer like, um, I don't know, Basecamp. 
Now, Basecamp is also a part of this coalition for app fairness, but we'll get to all that in a second. What Apple did yesterday was basically make the case for why the walled garden is great, both for people who are buying stuff from the walled garden, you and me, and people who are growing stuff inside the walled garden. Those would be the developers. Uh, they say that, you know, the reason that they do what they do is because they're holding the apps to the highest standards for privacy, security, and content. Made a big case for the amount of uh, business they're doing and stuff that's passing through. Over 100,000 apps are updated or submitted and reviewed every week. Last year, Apple rejected 150,000 apps for privacy guideline violations. Apple has removed over 60 million app reviews that it thinks are just spam. Basically, people just trying to game the app store. And the company has rejected more than a million apps over an unknown amount of time for illegal, unsafe, harmful, or objectionable content. Basically, what Apple is saying is the walled garden is good, the fruits in it are healthy. Well, they're free of disease. I mean, they might not necessarily be healthy. Could you really say that TikTok... <clears throat> they also message developers, by the way. Uh, this is what Mac Rumors had to say about what they said. The new developers page says, that's a lot of saying, uh, that 92% of iPhones issued in the last four years run iOS 13. Almost 90% of apps are reviewed within 24 hours. Uh, the page also declares that Apple has paid out over $155 billion with a B dollars to developers since 2008. And over 500 million people visit the App Store each week, which is kind of insane. Now, it also said that a majority of the apps don't actually pay Apple anything, which isn't 100% true because they paid $99 a year to be in the app developer program. It's practically nothing, but it's not nothing. But, you know, as long as we're splitting hairs and keeping track and all that stuff. Now, what's been interesting to me over the past few days is watching Apple kind of give a little on some of this stuff. One of the questions that was asked when... Uh, Capitol Hill brought uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos and Sundar Pichai and Tim Cook virtually to Capitol Hill. One of the questions that was raised was, why does Amazon get a special deal on the video, um, the video streaming service? Why do they pay less than other companies do? And Apple said, well, there's a program and Amazon's part of it. And everybody else was like, well, can we see the rules of this program? And Apple said, we're going to get back to you on that. And now Apple has gotten back to everybody. I could tell you what the rules are, but we're not streaming video people. So it doesn't really matter that much what the rules are. The point is, there is actually a clearly defined set of rules out there. Apple has actually published those rules now. They say there are like 130 um, premium video services around the world that are taking advantage of this program. So it's out there and it's an established thing. And if somebody who's doing streaming video wants to know either why they're not eligible or how they can go ahead and get in on that action, the rules are out there for people to see. Now, there was something that happened today. And this sort of breaks my rule about we're only going to talk about stuff that was already on Mac OS Ken, but I saw the story. I couldn't unsee the story, so I had to bring it. Um, remember earlier this year, Facebook launched a program where you could, let's say you run a yoga studio. Your yoga studio is closed because of COVID-19. You want to keep offering people instruction. You want to keep offering them classes. Facebook built a platform whereby you could go live and offer classes. And I could, because I want to be in yoga, uh, pay you for that. And you can do that through the Facebook app as well. Facebook said they're not going to take any money off of those charges until uh, August of 2021, I believe. So for a full year, they're not going to take a cut of anything that happened there. And they said to Apple, hey, we want to do this thing. We're not taking a cut. Will you please you know, eliminate your 30% take? And Apple said no. And Facebook was really public about the fact that Apple said no. Not quite as public as they wanted to be because Facebook actually wanted to put that in the app that was going through the App Store. Hey, we tried to get Apple to not take its 30% cut, but Apple said they wanted their 30% cut. And some, oddly enough, Apple wasn't into that. But here's the thing. Today, Apple has said, fine, we won't take our 30% cut till the end of the year. So it's not August of next year, but Apple has given a bit there. 
We'll be talking about that on Monday's edition of Mac OS Ken. Here's the problem that I have with Facebook's stance on that whole thing. And look, it's great that they're making that available, I guess. It's great that they sort of harangued, cajoled, guilted, shamed Apple into not taking their 30% cut. That's all good because as the yoga studio owner, I want you to be able to make as much money as you can. And in hashtag time, so Apple, you know, waiting that 30%. It's just being a mention if you ask me. The problem that I have is Facebook is still getting paid. And I know Facebook is not getting paid in money, but they're getting paid the way they always get paid. Information. The habits of the people who run that yoga studio, who set that thing up, the habits of the people who come in and pay the money and go, right? Facebook says to Apple, please don't take your 30%. Apple blinks in disbelief. Nobody is saying to Facebook, and you're not going to be taking any of the information from these poor souls, right? These people who are trapped inside, you're not going to be tracking what they're doing on Facebook. You're not going to be tracking the you know business decisions they make, the money that they spend through the Facebook app. You're not going to be doing any of that, right? Because, I mean, can you imagine the blank stare that you would get from Mark Zuckerberg? I would say blanker than a lot of the stares that he gives people a lot of the time, which I'm pretty sure is a practice look. I tried this mental exercise earlier. Let's say you signed up for a yoga class and you didn't go to that yoga class. What could Facebook do with that information? Well, they could start selling you self-help courses because obviously you're somebody who wants to do something better for yourself at this point. They could probably market you time management apps because look at that thing you missed. Uh, they could certainly sell you information about more events or I'm sorry, sell more, hmm, guide more events your way so that you'd be inclined to be more engaged with Facebook, you'd be inclined to spend more money. I'm thinking self-indulgent foods. Maybe you feel bad about yourself. They could target you with an ad that says, you're under a lot of pressure, wouldn't chocolate be great right now? And that's all stuff that Facebook could do. And listen, that's just, that's just my you know, dumb, non-machine learning, non-AI, non-advertising, non-marketing, non-tracking, tracking, excuse me, brain, thinking about all that stuff, right? There's so much information that Facebook is going to get off of all of this. To say that Apple is awful because it wanted to get paid, Facebook is getting paid. They're just not getting currency from the person going to the store or the virtual store or the virtual event or whatever. And of course, in 2021, once they've got this established, they're getting money from people as well. So really, it's the disingenuousness thing, disingenuity. It's the not 100% honesty that almost always bothers me, which is how we get, of course, to the Coalition for App Fairness. Um, just a bunch of scrappy developers, you know, Little guys trying to make their way in the universe. People like Epic Games, Deezer, Basecamp, Tile, Spotify, and others. According to TechCrunch, this uh, new organization formalizes efforts the companies already have underway that focus on other, um, uh, excuse me, on focus on either forcing app store providers to change their policies or ultimately forcing the app stores into regulation. I hate the fight going on between Apple and developers. I hate the fight going on between developers and the App Store. I hate it for a couple of reasons. I've been covering Apple for 15 years now, give or take. I mean, uh, longer ago than that, I would do stories on Apple, but focusing specifically on Apple for 14 or 15 years now, 15 or 16 years now, excuse me, one loses track after a while. What I always want to check myself on is am I so into the Apple thing that I can't see that the developers are actually correct on this, that Epic Games is actually correct on this, that Deezer is actually correct on this. And my thought is, no, that's not the case. All the arguments that Apple makes for the walled garden, I agree with. And here's the thing. When everybody says that Apple has a monopoly, it's true. There is one way onto this device. That's a magnet, by the way, so that I can keep it on the dashboard when I drive. But this is an iPhone, trust me. There's one way to get on this device, and that is through the App Store or jailbreaking or web apps. I mean, web apps are also a possibility. They're certainly an option. I don't feel like that means it's a monopoly because I have a friend who buys a new Samsung phone every year. 
that is an option that I have. Uh, there are LG phones. There are Huawei phones. I don't guess you can get them here. There's Xiaomi. Is Motorola still making phones? My point is, I do have an option besides iOS. And the whole idea that I'm being monopolized, I'm being railroaded. And this even happened with the uh, Coalition for App Fairness. I went to their website earlier because I wanted to check a couple of things. Uh, they actually say on their website, if you want a modern phone, you have to buy through the App Store. iOS doesn't have, or the iPhone, excuse me, does not have a monopoly. They don't even have um, a majority. It's an Android world. Now, I understand that uh, iPhone is where most of the money is made, and iOS is where most of the money is made for developers, but it's an Android world. To say that, you know, if you want a modern phone, then you're beholden to Apple, and so they're having to pay this 30% Apple tax, they keep calling it, rather than, you know, a commission or a fee or whatever. It's bogus and terrible, <laughs> in my opinion. Now, what's interesting is Bloomberg Editorials Board or Bloomberg's editorial board, excuse me, also thinks it's bogus and terrible. Uh, they basically came out and said that the framing that's going on with the Coalition for App Fairness is backward. Uh, the App Store has, in fact, been hugely useful for consumers. It stimulated competition and not least offered immense benefit for smaller companies. That was the other thing that I went to the Coalition for App Fairness site for, to see what they had to say about smaller companies couldn't find anything. Not saying there wasn't anything there. I only spent about 10 minutes on their site, but I couldn't find anything that said what they would replace it with, what they would suggest instead. Now, of course, they're not saying the app store should go away. They're just saying they should be able to sell in the app store for free. They're saying they should be able to sell in the app store uh, with their own uh, payment processing thing and, uh, and not pay Apple anything. And I'm not sure how they figure that because as far as I can tell, the App Store is not a utility. The App Store is a thing that Apple uses to sell software on phones. And the Bloomberg thing said it's true that 30% sounds like a hefty fee, but it's entirely in line with what other platforms and marketplaces charge for distributing digital content to their users. Fees for software sales at brick and mortar shops frequently exceed 60% uh, before the iPhone came along. And the vast majority of developers pay nothing at all. Only those that acquire customers or deliver goods and services through the app are subject to the fee. You could make the argument that 10 years ago was 10 years ago, that it was a long time ago. Yes, developers used to have to worry about printing boxes and burning CDs and, and getting those things shipped to CompUSA or, or, or you know, Byte Center or wherever. They used to have to worry a lot about physical de delivery. And then once they got the physical thing in the store, they were still only getting a fraction of what they would be getting today. They wouldn't be getting 70%. I know that that was true when we started buying the occasional app on our smartphones, our, our, our Windows uh, ME phones or whatever they were. I can't remember, honestly, the Palm Trail. Maybe. It was difficult to get stuff into the app stores at that point. And then the uh, percentage that they would take was huge, especially compared to what Apple is doing now. But all of that was 10 years ago, which in internet time is like 100 years ago. And we seem to have this idea that, okay, Apple did this thing a long time ago, and now you know, those days are over, and I should just get more just by virtue of the fact that I've developed something. I trust the app store. I don't go other places looking for apps. Now, maybe that's because I have an iPhone and I can't. But I don't even think about, is this going to be a safe thing to do? I don't think about, am I giving my payment information to yet another company? Because I'm not. They are the store that I go to. I trust that things that are in there are not going to poison me or, you know, put malware on my phone. Somebody has theoretically taken a look at the app at least and said, yeah, this will be fine, and let it go through. And if I don't like that, there's a whole world of Android phones for me to explore. Am I being myopic on that? I would love it if you would tell me. Uh, you can hit me up on uh, Facebook. No, you can't hit me up on Facebook. I'm not there. I'm sorry. Facebook is what we were talking about, or what we will be. I can't even remember. I can't keep up.
Twitter is where you can hit me up is my point at Mac OS Ken on Twitter. You can also email me info at Mac OS It is at Mac OS Ken on Twitter or info at Mac OS I do have a thing that I want to ask you to do, if you would, please, uh, sometime this weekend, if you have time, uh, could you share the stuff that I'm doing? Because I share the stuff that I'm doing, but I'm just one guy. Uh, and there are other people watching and listening, hopefully, to this. So uh, if, if you like what I'm doing here, please hit the like or the thumbs up thing or whatever. If you think other people might like it, please share it. Um, the same thing goes for Mac OS Ken and for In a Few Minutes and for The Checklist. Currently, I'm producing 11 shows a week. That's five for Mac OS Ken, uh, five for In a Few Minutes, and one for The Checklist. And then if I keep doing this, it's going to be 16 shows a week. And I'm not saying that means I deserve to be shared and liked, but if you like this stuff and, you know, maybe other people would too. And so if you would be kind enough to like and share the stuff that I do. If there's a subscription thing, uh, please subscribe. If there's a rating thing and you like it, please read it. If there's a rating thing and you don't like it, have you considered stuff that you might like more? Anyway. I'm going to talk really quickly about this other thing, and I don't, I don't feel like I know enough about it to really dive deep in on it. I want to suggest that you go check something out, though. The whole thing when Apple said that they were going to uh, uh, change uh, IDFA, right, the identifier for advertisers, when they said that when iOS 14 came out that they were going to make it possible for you as the, um, the person receiving the ads to say, you know, on second thought, I don't think I want them tracking this information. I thought that was huge. I thought that was a great thing. And I was really looking forward to denying all of the opportunities for everyone to track that I could. And then Facebook said that, you know, some of the smaller uh, companies out there were going to lose money because they rely on the advertising that Facebook does, which does rely on the cross-site tracking. And so they asked Apple to please not. And then some um, group in Europe said that they were worried about what it was going to do to their business. And so they asked Apple to please not. And I was really looking forward to Apple saying, no, what you shouldn't have been doing was tracking people's information from app to app to app, from site to site to site. I was really looking forward to Apple being righteous and exhibiting a bit of righteous indignation, saying, no, this happens when iOS 14 drops. Instead, what Apple has done is said, fine, we'll give you until sometime in early 2021. Kind of annoys me because if this is an unhealthy thing that's happening, then why am I having to go along with it so that they can figure out a way to start making other money? I think I would really like it if Apple had said, what you're doing is unconscionable. And now that we know about it, now that we know the extent of it, and now that we have the technology to stop it, we're going to do that. Instead, what Apple has said is, well, we're going to need you to stop poisoning people soon. When I say poisoning, I mean stealing people's information. It's been kind of amazing to me that, you know, people can have this business model that most of us think is kind of reprehensible and stand there and say, but this is my business model and have people go, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize it was business. Okay, fine. Go ahead for a little while longer. But seriously, we're going to have to talk about you not doing this at some point. I'm glad that's coming, though. Here's the one that scared me the other day. Uh, the Mozilla Foundation has been studying tracking and reliability of political ads heading into the 2020 election, which, you know, we're like, you can practically see it from here. I think we're like 40 days away as this thing that we're doing right now is happening. And it turns out that uh, political ads for streaming services and over-the-top services are kind of the Wild West. They all have some sort of... Um, um, in terms of service, but there's no clear idea of how the terms of service are actually uh, executed. Almost nobody has a library of ads that are out there saying that there's more information about it. Props to YouTube. YouTube TV does actually have a library of apps because, come on, excuse me, a library of ads because they're a video service. They're the place you go for all the video. So, of course, they have a library of those things. I can't remember who the one. There's somebody... Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. One of the services, though, is like, well, we're going to have a library of those soon. 
again, we are 40 days or so from the election. There's not a lot of Zoom left here. So hopefully they'll get on that. Uh, some of Mozilla's biggest findings, um, opacity, not transparency is the status quo, uh, good policies, but unclear enforcement, as I said a moment ago. Um, loopholes are common. So there are clear rules on what are clearly political ads. If, if it's vote John Doe or, you know, defeat Jim Smith, those are political ads. If it's the council for a cleaner water, I mean, that could be soft money, you know, doing a political thing and you don't really realize it. you think it's a PSA or you think it is an issues uh, ad, but it could actually be a political ad, but there's no clarity on how those are dealt with or even how they're flagged. All right. And you say, so what? Because it ends in 40 days. Well, first of all, it's, you know, the fate of the nation. But the scarier thing is all of that technology exists. All of that tracking exists. And none of that stops the day the political ads stop. All that stops the day the political ad stops are the political ads. But the advertising is still there. The tracking is still there. You're still sitting in front of the TV or, you know, whatever app that is or thing that is. Uh, here's what one of the people from Mozilla said. And I'm sorry, I should have like, um, I should have uh, highlighted who the person was. But here's what she said. I remember it was a her. How's that? Somebody from uh, Mozilla was actually the person who led the, uh, led the research. Uh, most platforms, most streaming platforms, excuse me, offer very complex ad targeting that is comparable to Facebook. Most platforms allow political advertisers to pull in third-party data, which means that viewers generally could be targeted with political ads based on household income, education level, marital status, causes they support, their political party affiliation, whether they're a registered voter, or whether they have cast their ballot already. Here's the part where I got scared. Non-political advertisers have access to even more complex tools, including customer matching, inferred behaviors, and uh, lookalike audiences. And they're going to be there the day after election day. They're going to be there as you are trying to decide what you're going to buy for Christmas. They're going to be there as you're trying to decide where to go on holiday. They're going to be there as you try to decide, should I sign up for that virtual yoga class? I don't know what you do about it. That's the problem. I don't know what you do about it. I mean, if you want more information, and I guess that's the first place to start. If you want more information, um, I'll try to remember to put a link uh, in the notes for today's video uh, because the full report is available. Um, Mozilla tracked six streaming services for its report, Hulu, Roku, Tubi, uh, CBS All Access, YouTube TV, and Sling TV. The good news is there is some good news in there. Uh, the bad news is as clear as Mozilla has tried to make it, or the Mozilla Foundation has tried to make it, uh, it's not 100%. So I guess just, you know, watch what you're watching and how you're being watched by it, I suppose. That takes care of just about everything I had planned for today. Um, I don't think I got feedback for this show. I don't think I have feedback for this show. I can make something up. Jim Smith says I shouldn't be advertising against him in the upcoming election, but John Doe appreciates my support. If you're here for the live thing, please stick around. I'll see if I can access the chat and we can chat for a bit. Uh, if you're not here for the live thing, I'm sorry you weren't. Uh, we haven't done, I haven't set up an actual time yet. What's been happening so far is it just goes off sometime in the afternoon. Basically, I figure out how much more time I have and say, oh, geez, I got to do that. I'm going to try to settle on a time here in the next week or so, assuming this all continues. Although it is Mac OS Ken Wesley. So good night, everybody. Sleep well. I'll most likely see you here Monday. Oh, and of course, uh, the checklist and, um, and um, Mac OS Ken and in a few minutes. So throw a rock in a streaming service and you'll hit me. And we're out. All right. I just, I, there's no chat, which is fine. Is there chat? There's no chat. Nobody's chatting. That's okay. I'm chatting. I'm chatting enough for all of this, I suppose. I didn't see that there was a message someplace. 
or mentioned someplace. Oh, on Twitter. There you go. Very kind. Very kind. Um, right. I can't see if anybody's saying anything. Let's see what stinks is. I'm going to watch this later and I'm going to find out where all the uh, chatting was. Oh, Bill says hi. Okay. So there was no chatting except Bill says hi. Hi, Bill. How are you doing? Oh, somebody just joined just in time to hear me say, we'll probably do this again Monday. Live stuff's available though. So, uh, you know, well, I mean, available to stream. It's YouTube. Everything's available forever, I would imagine. Um, I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. Second to last episode of Ted Lasso. I'm looking forward to that. Not looking forward to it being the second to last episode, but uh, I get to watch Ted Lasso tonight. Um, yeah, and recording with Michael LaPlante, actually, for uh, this week's in a few minutes. The return of Michael LaPlante. Uh, talking about Apple stuff. And wine, probably, because he's got a show. I, I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, but we'll talk about that. I think it's on YouTube, so search for Michael LaPlante, and you should find it. Um, yeah, all right. For everybody who's been coming to these, thank you very much. For everybody who's been watching it later, thank you very much. I will just keep uh, thanking you and thanking you and thanking you. So instead, I'm going to go. Have a great weekend. I will talk to you soon.